Lots of people sent us this one from the Weekend Australian magazine's real estate page. Quinn's Rock, WA. That's short for Western Australia, mind. This west-facing two-storey home has Pacific Ocean views. Built at the top of a very high hill, obviously. Good evening. And why do we doubt the accuracy of the caption to this picture in the Fairfax Herald? Greg Norman looks away in disgust after missing a putt for par. Even a weekend hacker wouldn't putt with what Norman has in his hand. It's a five iron, isn't it? And I suspect a cop hater at the Telegraph Mirror was responsible for this story about the World Police and Fire Games in Melbourne. Competitors will be vying for gold, silver and bronze medals in events such as pocket billiards. And yet again, the Courier Mail couldn't afford a comma to make sense of this story about school instruction on... Contraception, family breakdowns and sexuality during religion classes. Contraception during art classes is quite another matter. Which reminds us of the Sydney Herald's TV guide from last year. Three men and a baby grand. Andy and Neville appear as life-sized penises. And here they are as life-sized penises. <laughs> Ah, oh, right. <laughs> you are responsible for this fiasco. Well, according to our medical references, the average life-sized penis is around 15 centimetres. Yet another feminist plot to make men feel inadequate. Next, a couple of instances of why the 7.30 report is struggling. It's the old problem of quality control. He's just returned from an 18-month tour of duty in Somalia. The sound of constant gunfire still ringing in his ears. Then he should see a doctor. To prove the point, 7.30 took some liberties with the sound effects. It uh, becomes a normality to hear gunfire every day. Then there was this question to John Bertrand about his unexpected loss of San Diego. John, what sort of impact has this had on you uh, personally? Was this a live stream that disappeared before your eyes? Bertrand's reaction to the question says it all, really. It was this a live stream that disappeared before your eyes? In truth, the disappearance of the dinghy proved too great a challenge for Australian journalists. Of the cartoonists, only Cathy Wilcox succeeded. What went wrong with Australia One? A design fault in the sea. But others made the mistake of trying to superimpose a political allegory. John Kudelka, who had Keating's tax cuts going down with the ship, and Colin Wicking, who made it into a schism over racial hatred legislation. Elsewhere, the hyperbole was enough to refloat the Titanic, never mind a few tons of carbon fibre, e.g. the Herald Sun. Down, but not out. Team fights on after disaster. Five million dollar disaster. Tragedy. The worst disaster. Not just a disaster, but a national embarrassment. The telemirror was hardly different with the same domination of the words disaster and tragedy. But the Sydney paper added this non sequitur. The one Australia crew faced the challenge of putting a daunting unfairness behind them. What do they mean? Don't tell me it's Les Darcy and Farlap all over again. But all this boys and their toys stuff leads me to sailing and a media angle. This is John Westacott executive producer, i.e. helmsman, of the Packer Network's flagship, 60 Minutes. And the man who got me into this mess in the first place, John Westacott, my boss, and the owner of this beautiful old mahogany sloop named Celeste. And the item is a 60 Minutes piece by their resident bizarro, Charles Woolley, about that red-blooded Aussie fantasy sailing in the Sydney to Hobart. At first I was really genuinely afraid for my life but after spending the night leaning into this bucket I really don't care if I die. I'm curious wasn't it that despite those mountainous seas the water in Woolley's bucket remained so tranquil. Truth to tell it wasn't much of a story. The real story for us anyway was in this throwaway line. But racing now under the name of RAV4 Celeste to acknowledge the generous though discreet support of a certain car manufacturer. The full story is that executive producer Westacott persuaded Toyota, so they tell us, to part with not less than $60,000 and purely for the benefit of John Westacott. 
His boat received a major refit, new racing sails, new rigging, safety equipment, wet weather gear, the lot. And Toyota's quid pro quo? The none too subtle display of its name and logo throughout Woolley's story on every available surface. In our view, it's a matter of opinion of course, but in our view, the exercise was unacceptable by the proper standards of credible journalism. Surely Westacott has abused his position and the Toyota sponsorship of Nine's program to enrich himself unconscionably, and all because he could guarantee Toyota free promotion in the editorial content of this country's top rating current affairs show. I reckon about 15 minutes time we'll have that, see that spinning again. It's not a pretty sight that we make the rules arrogance and it's an unhappy precedent. Friday saw another manifestation of the hazards of big media, made even bigger by government policy that permits ever greater domination. More than 600,000 homes in Australia will have access to the most advanced pay television channel in the world within six months. This is the piece from the front page of Murdoch's Adelaide Advertiser. Note the advertising copy woven into Ian Horswell's puff piece. Gateway to a new era the most advanced pay television channel in the world. Providing the latest releases from the giant 20th Century Fox film studio. A press button menu of sports and movies. And even some advertising artwork. What you'll see. Some of the movies Foxtel subscribers will be able to watch. Most of which have already been shown on the free-to-air services. Foxtel is the news corporation Telstra joint venture and the Tizer was merely doing its bit as a loyal Murdoch medium. In precisely the same way, and for precisely the same reason, News Corp's Brisbane Daily, the Courier Mail, ran much the same style of advertising copy as news on its front page, including a display ad. The Foxtel offer. State-of-the-art digital technology to provide outstanding picture and CD sound. Murdoch's Melbourne tabloid allocated the whole of its front page to promoting its owner's commercial interests. The big TV switch on! And they obviously replaced the subs for the day with copywriters from the advertising agency. Finally, a clear vision on pay TV. 200 channels in cable television revolution. And here's a nasty piece of sleight of hand. Vote line. Question. Do you plan to subscribe to pay TV? If you phone in a yes answer, you'll go straight onto the Foxtel mailing list, I'll bet, and pay for the privilege. The maximum cost of each call is 25 cents. There's one born every 27.3 seconds. The Murdoch Sydney paper surrendered not only the front page to their master's voice, but also this double page spread of hard sell. Not so curiously, no other Metropolitan Daily shared the news values of News Corp. The Canberra Times put a different slant on the good news. Pay TV's heavies gang up on Optus. And what about Mr Murdoch's quality paper? Worse than all the rest put together, I'm afraid. The Telstra and news bosses grinned out, each in a suit that deserved to be taken outside and shot, from acres of print, all of it directed at a single objective. Selling Australians something that they probably don't want and certainly don't need. 11 pages, full pages, added to the Oz for this cretinous countdown. I'm sure Young and Rubicum have no complaints, which resulted in the op-ed page being displaced from where it should have been on page 11, back to page 27, following what they were pleased to call a special survey on Sri Lanka. Tycoon ownership and newspaper's editorial autonomy demonstrated to be incompatible yet again. And what of the other tycoons' response? Here's how the Packer Newsroom reported it. In business news, the Trade Practices Commission says it will investigate a pay TV venture announced today by News Corp, Telstra and Australis Media. Telstra has committed three and a half billion dollars to the deal. Everybody's got an angle because everybody's got an interest, including the ABC, which has done a deal to provide programs to a Fairfax consortium, though certainly not this program. It's absolutely implicit in a media spectrum of such limited range and ownership. Fairfax, incidentally, continues to throw up outstanding plagiarists. The latest being Leonie Lamont, with this piece on the Pope's visit two months ago. 
In these five paragraphs, Ms. Lamont wrote just 12 words, although the whole lot bore her byline. From Ms. Lamont's word processor came... Australian. But now... Down. Capital of Croatia. He... The Pope... Told... Over. All the rest was written by Andrew Gumbel, Rome correspondent of the English National Daily, The Independent. Ms. Lamont did, however, make one phone call from which she contributed three sentences, worth a byline in any man's language. Last for this week, the ABC's coverage of the Mardi Gras parade. This year, the commentary team featured Four Corners alumnus, David Marr. Here he is, putting a gloss on the glitz. And they feature fairies, fairies in the forest, Peter Pan, Tinkerbell, and assorted Australian fairies. Lots of moustaches coming up now. This is Leather Pride. These people are proud of, proud of their leather. The enthusiastic amateur is to be avoided, we think. If the parade is to become an ABC fixture, such as the Anzac Day March, we suggest bringing Martin Royal out of retirement. Here's how it might go. There they are. I thought perhaps the numbers were a little uh, too great because they only march usually about 20 or 30 behind their banner. And there they are this morning, still very spry. All of them. Let's give them a cheerio as they pass by us here at King Street. Even David Maher would have to admit that's preferable. Good night to you. Join us at the National Press Club in Canberra this week with guest speaker, Federal President of the Australian Medical Association, Dr Brendan Nelson. That's Wednesday afternoon on ABC. Coming up, Bottom.